Welcome back to the Life's Better podcast, where we say life is so much better with God, community, and purpose. My name is Jonathan Gleason, Josh Doolin, as hey. always. And today we are going to continue our conversation on habits, specifically seven habits of highly effective people. This is not our content. We're stealing this from Stephen Covey. Mm-hmm. Last month we looked at the first three. Today we're going to be looking at the next two. And then next month I think we'll look at the next uh, and final yeah. Six and seven. Otherwise, this becomes a really long podcast. We <laughs> thought we'd break it up just a little bit. However, before we get into that, we're going to play a game with each other. You guys can as follow always. along as well. And uh, here's the game. It's do you know your rhythm? Yeah. So you have <laughs> rhythms. You have habits. I have rhythms. I have habits. We're going to test to see if we know each other's rhythms and habits. Yeah, I'm excited because there's some things that I don't know if you know about me, and I also am interested to find out about you, so let's go. I'm sure everyone else is as well. (laughs) So I'm gonna ask you a question. You're not gonna answer it. I'm gonna answer it for you. Okay. And just to see if I I know your rhythm. So here it is. Are you more likely to be productive in the morning or at night? Mm. Now, moving with that, you know, productive, I, I, I know you probably like to stay up. And I, I think you probably like to, you know, do stuff at night. But when it comes to, like, productive, my mind goes to, like, work, getting things done, not just having fun. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to say morning for you, but I am not 100% sure on this at all. You know, this is something I'm still learning about myself, but that was my answer, okay. is morning. Uh, I lately have realized that I can get the most done in the first, like, three hours of being awake. Okay. I don't know why. But um, if I need a task done and I want to tackle it, nighttime is not the time to do it. It's the time that I want to just relax and hang out with Emily or hang out with friends uh, or do things that I enjoy. But in the morning, I wake up with this just like longing to accomplish something, accomplish something. And and so uh, I've there have been tasks at home, like cleaning up certain things or uh, organizing certain things. And. Um, I, I've started to wake up a lot earlier and so I'll wake up and tackle that task and it ends up making me, (laughs) like, I I was frustrated with myself lately because I've learned that I need to maybe even wake up even earlier because (laughs) I get so focused on that thing and I want to accomplish it and finish it that I end up late to work or like late to wherever I'm supposed to be. And then I'm like, ah, well, I was productive, but... Now, now everyone thinks I slept in. Nice, I'm getting nice. even worse. Well, now no. we know. Now we know yeah. we're just getting stuff done. Yeah. I, 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 lately, it's weird. I, I don't think I'm a morning person though. I'm not like happy about waking up early. Uh, but <laughs> I, I don't do even feel think morning people are happy about waking up. <laughs> it's just really because I would consider you. a Well, morning you tell person. me. You tell me. Is that yeah, my rhythm? Am I more more productive or at night or in the morning? I I think you're definitely more productive in the morning. Hands down. Yeah. Like it's not even. All your all your kids think that you're like the like you just wake up with purpose and like 100 percent energy. Is yeah, that true? You know, I, I crawl out of bed all the same. Like even <laughs> this morning, it's like ah, oh, it's so warm in here. Mm. But I mean, I, it, yeah, I I like I like getting stuff done, and mm-hmm. so they're right. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm just getting older because like forever <laughs> I've just complained about getting up, and now I'm turning into the adult that's. Ready to go. Let's get stuff done. Hey, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. (laughs) All right, next question. This time you're going to answer for me first, though. What do you do to turn things around when you're having a bad day? So I'm having a bad day. Mm -hmm. What's my rhythm to get back on track? You know, I I assume that you have to have like a million rhythms to help you stay positive. Mm. Um, My best guess is that it has something to do with being with family. Okay. Uh, Maybe... I don't know. I, I'm I'm wasting one of my answers because it's the same answer for a, another <laughs> one. But is it spending time with your boys or? So honestly, if I'm having a bad day, my rhythm is prayer. Prayer. Okay. It, it's one of those Going things. Go with the Bible answer. That's, I, it, that's I know fair. it sounds like <laughs> I'm just kidding. pastors that's really just making up stories, but it's true. Mm-hmm. I just need that time to recenter. Typically, I'm having a bad day because things aren't going the way that I want them to go. Mm. And in that prayer, God reminds me, well, guess what, Jonathan? This world and this life is not about you. And so you need to surrender that stuff to me. It's yeah. like, okay, fine. All right, I'll get back do on you, that. Do you do anything after that to sort of like, I don't know, cheer yourself up a little bit? Yell or? at you is typically, it's <laughs> like, all right, now I'm ready. I'm Take ready it out on Josh. Josh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, you know, prayer is usually, you know, yeah. what's needed and then I get back on, That's on good. track. Yeah. All right, so your rhythm, 
I, I'm going to say that maybe you you seek encouragement from others, mm. uh, whether that's a conversation where you're able to kind of express what's going on, or I uh, I don't know. I even I even threw out that well, he's a worship pastor. Maybe he worships. <laughs> so I, are either of those something that you do to turn things around? Worship is is one of the answers I wrote down. Uh, private worship by myself is just yeah. really. Uh, encouraging to me. It helps me get recentered, like you said. Uh, one thing I've done recently, and it's actually the journal that you uh, you guys gave me for Christmas I've used to do this, uh, is started a, um, a journal of moments I see God uh, in the people around me okay. uh, that I might have been used by God to help accomplish, if that makes sense. Yeah. So like, it's not like a like pat myself on the back type of thing. It's to remind myself that God is using me to do incredible things. And so if I'm having a rough day, if I'm maybe even having a moment where uh, I'm feeling like, you know, I'm not doing a, as great a job as I'm supposed to, uh, I can go back and read those moments and know, okay, well, even in recent time, like sure. God, I've seen God move. All right, third question is, what do you do to energize yourself outside of work? Mm -hmm. And I'm going to answer for you, so don't okay. answer yet. Okay. I think what you do is you engage activities like frisbee golf or tennis with Emily or other fun things like that with friends or family. Okay. Is that, that the rhythm? That's pretty much right. I just said spend time with family and okay. friends. Okay. It doesn't really matter the activity as long as I'm, I'm an extrovert, and so I get my energy by being around people that, I enjoy being around. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah. Yeah, for you, I, I would guess your family. Adventures with family. Yeah. That's exactly how I would share it. Yep, mm -hmm. adventures. That's what we like <laughs> to do. All right, four, uh, number four, what is your most used emoji? So uh, you're going to answer for me maybe I know some this. rhythms. Do you? Okay. I know this. It got? has to be the thumbs up because you sit <laughs> to everyone uh, at the end of conversations which I would just normally like let like the conversation go like oh yeah I got that and people have told me that that's rude so like you have this little thumbs up emoji you send out to people all right so the thumbs up I think is quickly overtaking but I think I have one that I use okay. more often okay and it's just the standard big smile okay and I could be wrong but I, honestly, I, it's in so many of my, I even like reviewed some. I was like, I don't really know because I'm branching mm -hmm. out. I'm branching out and using other emojis. <laughs> and so it was it was a toss up between mm -hmm. the thumbs up and the smiley face. But I, I think it's still the smiley face. Okay. Okay. I guess I just don't make you smile that, that often. <laughs> I'm just kidding. As long as you're not getting the thumbs down, it should, probably should That's be true. good. That's true. Do you send that, that one out I, at all? I, I think I have maybe like to be funny, <laughs> but not really serious. So I think yours... Is it the laugh, like cry one? Like he's laughing so hard he cries? Is that 100%. Yes. 100%. Yes. I use that way too often, probably. <laughs> I, it's the, you know, do you have like the most used emoji thing that and, pops up? And that's how I knew it wasn't the thumbs up because mm -hmm. I looked, but mm -hmm. it was like the second one. So my like, first oh. one is that one, and then the second one is the like toppling over laughing crying face oh, like there's yes. two different ones and I think you were the only one who uses that mm. or that at least text I, me I like to use that one if it legitimately actually made me laugh really hard okay. so like if you know if you got that one from me it like legitimately made me laugh out loud That's the cool. other one is just like haha that was funny no, but yeah I like it all right number five what do you most often do to unwind after a busy day gosh every single answer I have for you revolves around the boys um, but I gotta say, like, I don't know, you just seem like the type of person who really enjoys hanging out with them. Uh, I think when you come home, like, it's definitely not the dog <laughs> that, like, brings, brings you, uh, the most joy and how you unwind. No. I would, I would say finding something fun she'll, or, she'll like... She'll wind me up, so she'll do. <laughs> Man. It, it's gotta be hanging out with Dana or, uh, maybe, like playing video games with the boys or something like that. So it's something really specific. Okay. And you're, you've got the right idea, mm -hmm. but one of the things that we do, and this is typically right before we send the boys off to bed, mm. is we will read together. Dana mm. will read to us. Yeah. And it's whatever book we happen to be reading. Dude, I love that. That's like <laughs> such a, okay, I'm just like chilling and unwinding. That's like some, sometimes my favorite part of at least the evening. Um, so yeah, that's what we do. That's doing. really cool. I would say... Shows and movies with Emily. So it used to be that. Oh, uh, Emily has, in recent months, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm showing the world how nerdy you are, but 
she's gotten fully into the board game sphere too. Okay. And so we've we've almost nightly will pick one game okay. that won't last maybe 30 minutes to an hour. Yeah. And before we go to bed, we're just going to play a game and have fun. And, uh, you know, we used to just sit there and watch shows a lot or we'd cook a bunch. We still cook a bunch. Yeah. But, like, we've not been watching TV as often, like nearly it's as often. It's better interaction time anyway, so that's probably a yeah, healthy we, rhythm to get we, into. We talk a lot more now, yeah. which is really great. Um, and hopefully not, it's not like, oh man, you know, I can't believe you like stole my... <laughs> We're competitive whatever. for sure, but uh, you know, it, it's normally pretty... pretty <laughs> you extreme. go to bed angry. <laughs> 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 Alright, last one. What is one habit you have at work that you don't think anyone knows about? So, okay. I'm gonna answer for you. This one's probably more real than like what I would share is he knows my habits. I don't know if this is one that, I don't know. I'm gonna go with toilet after coffee. Like, <laughs> like coffee's a natural laxative, I'm told. And so it's like, as soon as you've had that coffee, it's like, all right. <laughs> is this coming because you know, like Josh has been here about 15, 20 minutes. <laughs> all right. He's gonna be using He's the gonna toilet. He's gonna be using the bathroom. I gotta make sure I play in my bathroom trip there. around when Josh sleeps. I did have to think through, okay, what, what does he do? <laughs> and, and that did come to my mind, but mm. it's not that I'm, I'm keeping track of <laughs> no, your that, bowel movement. That's a fair <laughs> rhythm. I mean, like, yeah, my body's regular, you know? Uh, <laughs> that's not it. I don't think that's it. That's not the one it. I wrote. Um, some people probably don't know that I'm I'm a person who works best when I have something to listen to. Oh, yeah. um, and so anytime you come in my office, yep. anytime anyone comes into the, the church, you'll see me with headphones in. And it's not because I don't want to talk to anybody. I love talking to people. But I have learned that when I'm in my quiet office, my mind wanders too much. And I can't, can't accomplish the things that I'm supposed to do. And oftentimes it's podcasts that... I'm not even like incredibly interested in. It's just noise yeah. that allows um, you to focus on. It's not my sermon ones that I like to listen to because otherwise I'm, I'm giving them my full attention. Sure. If it's, it's, just, it's just noise. I like, I like to listen to people talking and about nonsense and it helps me work and focus. I don't know why. Yeah. I, have, I couldn't explain it. All for right. you, what do you think? For you, I, I don't know a whole lot of them either, um, but I do know there's one uh, that if you, in case you don't know, uh, every Monday, oh, yeah. Jonathan cannot be bothered. He has a very big plan to get a lot of his sermon done, yeah. uh, at least the, the bare bones and uh, a lot of the, the, the tough uh, study part. Uh, and I don't think you leave until you get that done. No. Yeah. It, the Monday does not end until that's completed. Otherwise, yeah. my week just, there's too much anxiety yeah. about over it. So Which, honestly, Mondays. you've identified that if you wait, you have way too much anxiety, and yeah. so like, well done. Like you've you've yeah. you've planned ahead. So that yeah. is a rhythm. The one that you may not know about is far sillier okay. and not nearly as cool. So <laughs> you used to watch SpongeBob as a kid, right? Absolutely. So you know SpongeBob really has a passion to get his boating license, mm -hmm. but cannot. And there's so many episodes where he tries and fails. Yes. So do you remember the episode where someone gave him the advice? Focus on the road, nothing but the road. Yes. And he says it as a mantra, focus mm -hmm. on the road. And so he just nothing like, that's all he does, and it, it becomes, you know, mayhem ensues. So <laughs> when I find myself distracted here at the office, I will actually say that mantra. <laughs> I'll say, John, sometimes out loud even, yeah. focus on the road, nothing but the road. <laughs> focus on the road, nothing but the road. And I'm not actually focusing on the road, I'm focusing <laughs> on what I'm doing, but yeah, that yeah. like gets me back into my focus concentration. Super okay. weird, but... I assume you didn't know that. No, I didn't. Yeah, That's, there it is. I didn't even know that you watched SpongeBob <laughs> at all. So I'm yeah, glad to know. Yeah, not anymore, but for a while it was mm -hmm. on the it was on the playlist. Okay, so we are going to get into far more helpful content at this point than we're, SpongeBob. We're we're going to review it. <laughs> hey, who knows? Maybe that'll end up being like a wonderful little life hack for you, but probably not. So we're, let's review. Josh, no pressure here, but what are the first three habits of highly effective people that we looked at in January? Okay, so we want to be proactive. Yep. We want to begin with the end in mind. He's in order already. This and is we great. want to, what is the third one? Oh man, I don't want to look at my notes. I don't want to cheat. Put. I'm going to cheat. Put. Put first things first. That's first right. things first. Ah, dang. Yes. Okay. Well, you know what? You get like a half a point on that half one. Half a point. That's okay. pretty good. We're going to look at the number five and number, uh, excuse me, number four and number five on Stephen Covey's list of the habits that are really involved in the most effective people. Uh, this next one is think win win. Think win win. Josh, you already said that you're pretty competitive. Uh, yes. Would that be 
with sports, when are you most competitive in life? When does it most come out of you? Mm-hmm. Board games, mm-hmm. sports, sports, what is it? Uh, yeah. soccer specifically. Okay, I don't know why. Okay, <laughs> uh, I think most people, even those who say they're not competitive, there is a natural competitiveness I mean, yeah. to most of us. I, this creates though a win lose or lose win experience in most situations. So, yeah. for example, I may win the game, you lose the game. Mm-hmm. You may get the last slice of pizza, I lose the last slice of pizza. I get the promotion, you don't get the promotion. You get to watch your favorite movie, and I'm stuck watching Legally Blonde for like the 10th time. So this win-win is not something that usually comes naturally to people. Mm. Normally it's a lose-win or a win-lose scenario. And I think one of the reasons for this, and again, if we're going to move towards a win-win mindset, uh, we've got to stop being competitive and we need to start being cooperative. But one of the reasons why I think so often we're not cooperative is because we're operating on a scarcity mindset. Yeah. Now, if you're not familiar with what a scarcity mindset is, Josh, give us a quick definition, maybe a couple of examples of what a scarcity mindset yeah. is. So the idea is that there's just not enough to go around. And so uh, it it might play out in your mind as I got to get what's mine first. And that can apply to very serious situations or even silly ones. The best example I have of this is with my students and whenever I bring food or pizza or something like that in, uh, I have some students who haven't been in youth very long yet uh, who rush to the front because they think there's not enough to go around. And it's funny because I'm, my older students all know and they don't rush because I always buy way too much. So, but they're coming in thinking, I gotta get the best slice, I gotta get my slices first because there's no way Josh bought enough for everyone. Uh, And uh, you know, it can come into play with not only food, but uh, with jobs. Uh, You can can try to rush ahead of everyone else around you. You can try to take credit for things that may have been a group project um, or, I, I, I'm, I'm, there's tons it's, of, yeah, whether, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. I mean, mm-hmm. we, we are consistently competitive. And I think that the, you know, in contrast to the, uh, to actually that competitive spirit is really having an abundance mindset. Instead mm. of scarcity, we have an abundance mindset. And the abundance mindset knows that there are limitless wins for everyone. Uh, an example of this, let's just go with soccer because you like soccer and you're really competitive. So when you, let's say we're on the, uh, uh, different teams, mm-hmm. but we're going to play this Saturday. We take the field. You have a goal. You want to win. You want to win. I have the same goal. I want to win. But mm-hmm. let's say that you go in with an abundance mindset. Hopefully, you're already living out some of the other practices that we talked about last month, maybe even beginning with the end in mind. And so your goal, although is to win, you may have like five or six other goals that you can still achieve. Yeah. That goal might be having fun with friends and teammates. That goal might be staying in shape, learning a new skill, or developing and honing this current skill. It might be uh, finding some way to overcome adversity when you know, you're down three points. But if these are your goals, well, guess what? Even if you don't score as many as the other team, but you achieve those, that's a huge win mm. for you. And this is, again, the abundance mindset that most of us really struggle with because we get locked into a win-lose, lose-win scenario. Yeah. Let's yeah. give another example, um, but this time I'm going to put you on the spot and you're going to have to come up with a win-win for this situation. Okay. We work in the same office. Let's say we record this podcast. After we record, you go to work and I go to work. I'm working hard on programming the next event. You're working hard on coming up with some songs for Sunday you're having to play your music, you're listening to some chords, you're just making a bunch of racket in your office, and I'm okay. so distracted, and I cannot focus on programming. And so in this situation, I could go for win, lose, Josh, shut that off, <laughs> can't concentrate here. And you would probably withdraw, turn it off, and not get what you needed to get done, done. Mm-hmm. Or I could be maybe overly concerned about you and be like, oh, I can't get this stuff done, but Josh needs to listen to his music. I just gonna suffer through it, you and now lose, win. I'm yeah. losing. You're winning. So mm-hmm. how can we win? Win. So you have to let me know that it's a problem, but uh, do so in a way that won't make me lose, like ruin my day. That'd be the only thing I can focus on. Uh, 
it, I mean, we can solve it in a number of ways. I could find another place to continue my, my worship practice. If it's just listening to music, I could put on headphones uh, or even uh, like, I mean, I, I don't know, like if you have like noise canceling headphones, yeah. you can put those on uh, and yeah, a number of solutions. And I like the fact that you pointed out that I have to actually have the confidence to mm -hmm. talk to you about it. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people, they don't have the courage to speak up when they yeah. have a need yeah. or even a desire. And so they'll immediately move into the, well, I'll, I'll go in and lose for the team. Yeah. So you gotta have the courage to, to speak up. But at the same time, some people have too much courage and it's all about the win for themselves and you need to have consideration. So I think that the two things at play here for us to actually live out that win-win is first of all being creative, realizing, okay, there's multiple ways that we can both have a win here, but then I have to have the courage to speak up. I have to have the, the consideration to know, okay, but Josh still needs to get this stuff done. It's not just about me. Mm. Yeah. All right, so here's the challenge for win-win. Be creative. Understand that there are multiple ways that you know, different people can have wins and think creatively about those. And then when you have a creative solution, have the courage to speak up, but also have the consideration to understand where the other person is at. All right, this leads us to our fifth of the seven habits of highly effective people. And that is to seek first, to understand, not just to be understood. Hmm. All right, you, you, do have, you have perfect eyesight, don't you? Yes. Let's imagine that you're starting to dim and it's, you know, it's not bad, but you're, you know, you can't make out details, signs. So you go to the optometrist. You explain the situation to the optometrist and he says, okay, I know, I know exactly what we need to do here. He takes off his glasses and he hands them to you. You put them on, not knowing where he's going with this. And you say, sorry, doctor, uh, it's way worse. Like it's so blurry. Mm -hmm. And he looks at you like, you gotta be kidding me. I've been using these for like 10 years. These are perfect. <laughs> How can you not see? Well, seriously, it's so blurry. You're just not trying hard enough, Josh. Try harder to see. Okay. This is a really good example. And you're like <laughs> trying harder to see now. And you're like, no, I, in fact, I think I'm getting a headache from these dumb glasses. How ungrateful are you? You come into my office, <laughs> I give you a clear solution, and now you, right? Okay, so, silly, weird, mm -hmm. where are we going with this? There's a way that most of us listen, and there's a way that that leads to us typically communicating with people, and that's called autobiographical listening. Mm -hmm. What is autobiographical listening? I'll give you the textbook definition. It's listening to a person with your own perspective and with the intent to respond, uh, excuse me, to reply instead of to truly listen and understand. Mm. Now there are really four aspects to autobiographical listening. We're gonna hit these really quickly because I think every single one of us is guilty of them um, time and time again. What is the first really key aspect of autobiographical? So it's listening? to evaluate, and this means that you're only listening to um, decide if you agree or disagree with them and then responding immediately. So an example of this might be uh, Jonathan coming in and saying, you know, the Rams were so good against the 49ers. There's no way that anyone can beat the Rams in the Super Bowl. And me, no, 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 hold on. The Bengals are that much better though. And they beat Kansas City. There's no way that they can be beat. I just listened to him to get an opinion and then immediately decided, he wants my opinion. That's why he's talking about this. Right. He just wants me to interject. Yeah, yeah. And, and so often, conversations are like that. I mean, we may not even let someone finish. If we immediately disagree, it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Mm -hmm. you, that's mm -hmm. crazy. You know? And they haven't even finished what they're saying. Uh, or if we agree, we want to speak over them. So they're not even finished with their conversation. You're like, oh, yeah, no, I totally agree. That happened to me last week. You're not actually listening. You're just listening so that you can either agree or disagree and keep the conversation rolling. Another way that uh, we use this autobiographical listening is probing. Uh, the idea here is that you ask questions for, from your own perspective. Mm -hmm. I find myself doing this with my boys a lot. Maybe there's an argument that broke out in the other room. And I walk in and immediately the question is, hey, what's going on here? Now, just that question alone, I'm probing, but I'm probing with my own perspective. The perspective mm. is, these guys are out of control. <laughs> they were being way too loud. Some kid's crying over here or some kid's in rage over here. And, and there's, there's a problem that dad has to fix. And so then I may even go a little bit further and probe. And my, again, my probes are are all from my perspective. Like, hey, wouldn't you think it'd be better to actually share in this situation? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Don't you think it'd probably be uh, a little more helpful as a family not to scream and shout? Like, 
All I'm doing is coming from my perspective. Have I listened to them? Have I really heard what's going on emotionally? Do I know what they're going through? No, I'm just taking it from my perspective mm-hmm. of you're loud, out of control, and you need to get back in line. So this is how we oftentimes listen. What about uh, some other aspects of autobiographical listening? So the next one is advice, and it's not necessarily good advice. It's just <laughs> uh, advice based or counsel based on your own experience. So I liked your example you had in your email uh, because, you know, this happens all the time as men, uh, you know, your wife or girlfriend or whoever might come home and uh, she's talking about some problems at work and a coworker she doesn't get along with. Uh, and you, based on your experience with problem solving, problems at work with coworkers, just immediately say, oh, well, you need to do X, X, X thing. And then... Perfect. Solve their problem. They don't really need to keep talking about it. And when they keep talking about it, it just annoys you because you already gave them the solution. So, yeah, yeah that's the advice. The, the fourth <laughs> aspect of autobiographical listening is interpreting. And this interpretation comes from, again, your own behavior and your own motives. I, I've got a silly example based on even what you said about the youth. So, you're bringing a bunch of snacks, maybe it's a bunch of cookies. This time you don't overbuy. Mm. Uh, your, your budget's a little strapped and you're like, ah, guys, only take one or two cookies. And so, you know, you got this kid, he immediately grabs two cookies, shoves them down his you know, gullet and he's back for more. Or at least that's what you think because that's, that's how you would respond. I mean, you love cookies. You were even thinking maybe <laughs> after this, they might be leftovers. You could enjoy some cookies with Emily and playing some board games at the end of the night. Uh, here's the thing though, as he's talking to you and he's beating around the bush about, oh, the cookies and wow, not everyone's eating one. He hasn't come out and said he wants another cookie. You're starting to interpret based on your behavior Mm. and you say, okay, I know what you want. You want thirds, don't you? You want fourths, don't you? (laughs) And then he looks at you and says, no, actually I was hoping to grab uh, a cookie for my brother at home who loves chocolate chip cookies. You're like, whoa, how did I get this one so wrong? Well, again, it came down to interpreting it based on your own behavior and your own uh, motives. So that's autobiographical listening. There is a much better way to listen, particularly Mm. if we're going to listen to understand rather than just being understood. And that is empathetic listening. What Mm. is empathetic listening? I'll give you again the textbook definition. It's to project yourself into another person's personality and situation to better understand that person's emotions or feelings. Hmm. Now, there are a lot of benefits to empathetic listening. We're just going to share five of these really, really quickly. What's the first benefit to actually listen, listening with empathy? So the first one is actually it boosts the confidence of the speaker. So um, if somebody is actually really listening to you and understanding all of a sudden you feel way more confident about whatever you're sharing. Uh, If this is a person who isn't confident around you or maybe is a stranger, like this is really important. Yeah. Um, Because, I don't know, I I can't tell you how many times where uh, I've just needed somebody to to hear me out and and that one person was just listening well and it was really helpful. Yeah. On top of that, it gains the speaker's cooperation as Mm -hmm. they know that you're actually for them you're understanding them. There's nothing that they're competing. Uh, you know, the, the different ideas of, I don't agree, you know, the Rams are horrible, and you know, whatever it is. Yeah. What's another benefit? Uh, number three is it reduces stress and tension. So this goes along with the confidence thing. Um, I, I, I've shared, you know, sometimes I just really need somebody to understand what I'm, what I'm saying, and all of a sudden when somebody actually hears you out, boom, that problem seems a little less of a problem because somebody else Hmm. has heard you. Uh, And maybe you even see that whatever you're sharing, it doesn't bother them nearly as much as it bothers you. Uh, And so, boom, all of a sudden, you interpret their action or reaction as what you should be reacting, and all of a sudden, you've calmed down as well. And then last, well, I shouldn't say last, the last one I'm going to (laughs) share is it builds teamwork. So this is a great way if you're at work or with a family, to be someone who's truly trying to understand, put yourself in their situation, that just draws people together. It doesn't repel people as autobiographical listening can quickly do. Yeah, and then the last one is one that I've seen time and time uh, with the people that I trust, uh, it, it gains trust. So 
uh, people like Jonathan or people like Emily or people like my best friend Max, I feel like I can go to them and talk to them about things and they're actually going to listen and that just builds more and more trust uh, because I know that what I'm sharing they actually care about and that they'll they'll genuinely, whatever they give me as advice later, if they start to give me advice, mm. uh, will be because they've put themselves in my shoes. They understand my situation. Yeah. So. I think the big question now is, well, how? How do we actually listen empathetically? Because we naturally are autobiographical listeners. How do we do it with empathy? Stephen Covey gives a few tips on how to do this. We're going to talk about two of them, and they don't they're not easy. So these are going to be some challenging uh, tasks, but this is the challenge that we're giving you when it comes to uh, seeking first to understand rather than just being understood. We would encourage you to rephrase the content and reflect the feeling. Mm -hmm. So you've just listened to somebody and you're listening to truly understand, put yourself in their shoes, but then once they're finished, once there's a pause and once it's appropriate for you to respond, what you're going to try to do is you're going to try to rephrase what you've just heard and also try to highlight the emotions that they are having. So let's go back to the example of a spouse comes home, they immediately launch into some of the struggles of the day you're listening you're not interrupting when there's a pause you're going to rephrase what they've just said well you know it sounds like you're really having a hard time with your boss mm. and then what you're going to do is you're going to try to find out okay what emotional state are they in because of this and it sounds like that's really frustrating you that gives them an opportunity to correct any uh, misunderstanding well no it's actually you know, my boss is a really great guy. I, it was just one of those weird things that happened today. Normally we really get along. And then what are you gonna do again? You're going to rephrase what you've just heard and you're going to try to communicate the feelings that are coming off of it. And you're gonna do this again and again and again until they have completely been heard and understood. And that typically allows you then to either speak some words of encouragement or if they ask for advice, that's a, a chance for them to now actually receive that and not get defensive. Or you can just kind of hug and say, sorry, babe, I'm, I'm praying for you. Um, one of the other benefits or one of the other encouragements in order to actually uh, listen with empathy is you have to be willing to let the other person dominate the conversation. Mm. So hard, right? Uh, usually there's a give and take. You just have to take a step back and let them dominate. And that means not interrupting, and that typically means not talking over them. How do you feel when people interrupt you, Josh, or try to talk over you, particularly when you're dealing with something that you want to get out and share? I definitely feel like I wasn't heard, yeah. and it just makes me want to leave and not be around that person because they're not... They just want to offer solutions or they just want to be heard. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, challenge, guys. We want you to have highly effective relationships. So, the challenge for you is to listen with empathy. And I think there's this really great Bible verse uh, that Josh is going to read for us that actually has already told us to do this. This is actually in James. So, yeah. So, I forgot my Bible, but I think I remember most of it. And you can. Correct me, maybe. Oh, if why you, will? If you, okay, so it is uh, be slow to speak, uh, quick to listen, and slow to become angry. Yeah. And I forget the rest of it. But do that's, you remember that? That's it right there. Okay. So if you want to see it in your own translation, <laughs> that is James chapter 1, verse 19. But we're going to challenge you guys to be highly effective by uh, being slow to speak. Instead, mm. you're going to listen and you're going to hear and you're going to step your, uh, put your shoes, sorry, put your feet into their shoes. But yeah. I think I said that a little strange, but I think <laughs> you get the idea. And until next time, uh, we want you guys to work on both of these habits. Uh, if you want to share them with us, please mm. do so. Uh, but otherwise, know that life is so much better with God, community, and purpose. So continue to do life with God, community, and lots of purpose. God bless.